Greetings everyone and welcome to TNO The Last Days of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mokalover, in which we're playing as the Italian Empire. Now, I've already played the Italian Empire once, and we went down the more, let's say, <clears throat> the autocratic path, but here we are and we're going to play as Democratic Italy as I promised for the month of 2021 in January. So, we already had a session of the 33rd of uh, the Grand Council done, but let's go ahead and go with... I did this one before, but let's go with Forza immediately. Italy's primacy over its empire and its allies must not be ensured through naked coercion and sable, saber rattling. Instead, Italy must act as a beacon of stability, prosperity, peace and in the Mediterranean and in Europe. We must work to better integrate the various nations under our protective wing into a unified economic and political structure. This is the official party line endorsed by G G Galeazzo. Galeazzo, Siano, the Conduce, and while it might have prevailed at this session, it's hard to tell how this will translate into practice. I love authoritarian democracies. Also, I'll set up. I pretty much set up everything off screen except for our ships, which I will deal with off screen. So let's go to the naval map mode. Actually, uh, for now, all of you guys, doesn't matter what you do. No, actually, well, let the time go on because I just want to train them. That's all I want to do. Just train, spend up all that fuel for now, just because we can. Everyone's already set up uh, for the most part. I've already shifted all the armies around. We'll deal with the navy in a little bit. Eh, off screen, but the Duce's Congress. Session 33rd of the Grand Council of <clears throat> that Fascism has started at Palazzo della Farne Farnesina in Rome. As journalists and policemen swarmed around politicians and ministers entertaining the Ostea Rationalist building, with delegates and representatives from all the upper echelons of the fascist government gathered in the Eternal City, the Duce took the floor to address the numerous problems faced by Italy and its empire. Despite being the world's fourth superpower, Italy is still plagued by a myriad of issues both domestic and foreign, including growing dissatisfaction towards the fascist regime and rising dissent in the colonies and puppets making up Italy's empire. Oh, I forgot about this too. Siano's speech was met with thunderous applause from the Grand Council, but one part of the delegates were much colder than others, particularly the current secretary of the PNF's Carlos Scorza and the politicians closest to him within the party are known for the opposition to the Duce. And rumors seem to imply that tensions inside the PNF are now growing by the day. Hopefully Siano can keep everything under control. Well, we'll see. Prepare a special committee. Around the person of Galezio Asiano, a small number of prominent party members and high-ranking officials have gathered, functioning as an underground or unofficial council of advisors to the Duce, including party politicians like Dino Grandi and generals such as Giovanni de Lorenzo. Solidifying and cementing the small clique as the Duce's inner circle will be vital to carry out Siano's plans, as fierce opposition from within the ranks of the PNF might at any moment bring the Duce's reforms to a crashing halt. Very good, and we're doing quite well on our deficit. Uh, and we're building up a lot of civilian factories. The mods we're using are the State Chancellor Tool Mod. Player of the Peace Conferences, even though it doesn't even matter, I just, just keep it on by default. And TNO, only three mods, and we have rubber processing done. The Secret Committee. Despite its facade of order and efficiency, it is well known that the Roman politics are a den of snakes, and while it appears that Siano is firmly at the helm of his nation and his party, in reality, internal opposition is growing stronger and stronger in a secret meeting at Palazzo of Venezia. A small number of high-ranking members of the PNF, as well as some generals from the armed forces, have gathered in Palazzo of Venezia to speak with the Duce regarding the situation, including party politicians like Dino Grandi, generals like Giovanni de Lorenzo, and Tim Diplomats like Edgardo Sogno, the newly formed secret committee, will function as the Duce's inner circle to oppose a clique of party politicians gravitating towards Carlos Corza, but we must keep our friends close. We shall immediately speak to the council, though. Among the ranks of the Grand Council, one can find an image of the varied and often contradictory components and interest groups that make up the fascist states. Black shirt generals, bureaucrats, scholars, and many more. This somewhat colorful ensemble of characters, uniforms, and medals, and suits must be reined in and convinced that the Duce is working for them all. Pleasing everyone is impossible, but there are undoubtedly many among the council that could be swayed to Siano's side, strengthening his ranks, and politically isolating Scorza, which would be a very good thing. Now, I've already done, like, the more fascist side of Italy before, so... And I know at the time of this recording, there is a sub-mod that makes Italy more manageable and really readily available and playable. I did not want to use that because I want to see how the more authoritarian democratic side of Italy is like without any sort of, you know, mod, at least for now. Because someday I will come back to Italy and play them again once Italy is actually quite fleshed out and much better, but... Siano speaks in the council. Siano is once again taking the floor before the Grand Consiglio, this time directly attacking factionalism and division inside the PNF. While never mentioning explicitly, it is rather clear that this address was aimed at Scarlo Carlo Scorza and his ever-growing faction opposers to the Duce. Immediately, the situation became somewhat tense as Scorza and his men were visibly distressed. Many observers, both international and Italian, started to speculate that the Verona conference meant to happen in the near future would be more than just a regular general congress of the PNF, but actually the occasion when the two factions are starting to form and the party will finally clash. And keep your enemies closer. The road to freedom. 
Oh, why not? The numerous restrictions and oppressive measures that we've placed upon our new global subjects in the Empire are born out of emergency. Now that our hold over the Mediterranean is firm, we can start moving towards great, granting greater autonomy and freedom to our vassals in the Balkans of Middle East and Africa. We will still maintain our sphere of influence, but without the need for violence or threats. Italy shall be the first amongst equals in a community of nations, all sharing the common goal of building peace in Europe and protection against the brutality of the German boot. And what do we have here? Fire the current leader? Well, who's the current leader for this project? Uh, optimization, we're working at sluggish pace, and I'm just going to keep him there. So, Siano argues for the liberalization of the Empire. A victory has been scored by the Duce, as newspapers and media outlets enthusiastically report about Siano's speech before the Grand Council. With fiery words, Roman reminiscences, and rhetorical bombast, the Duce argued for a new policy towards the numerous Italian puppet states and allies in her sphere, from Algeria to Arabia, Epirus to Ethiopia. The Grand Plan includes granting more autonomy to subject states, gradually disengaging the Italian armed forces from the Empire, instead of relying on native troops, and finally integrating the economies of the sphere to turn the Empire into a community in which Italy's a primus inter Paris in true Roman fashion. The council's reaction was mixed, split between thunderous applause and barely concealing rumbling as the radicals within the PNF accused Siano of betraying the principles of autarchy and corporatism from which fascism rose. Such objections, however, fell on deaf ears, and many within the PNF looked forward to the benefits of a new imperial policy and perhaps reaped some of them for themselves. Everyone wins, it seems. In which we must remind the king. His imperial and royal majesty Umberto II, by the grace of God and the will of nation, king of Italy and Albania, emperor of Ethiopia, first marshal of the empire, is a man with numerous grandiose titles but little real weight in politics. Italian kings have rarely directly, directly meddled with the kingdom's political troubles, and Umberto II is no exception, instead preferring to act as a symbolic figurehead. However, with the Verona Congress now appearing on the horizon, it would be wise to involve the king in drawing up emergency and fallback plans in case something in Verona goes horribly wrong. We expect the Congress to proceed in an orderly and calm fashion, but perhaps Perhaps one can never be too cautious, of course. And how are we doing over here? Looking not too bad. At this point, actually, regarding trade, let's go ahead and get some good old trading buddies set up. How many civilian factories do we have working on stuff? Not enough. So as much as I want to grab more steel so we can make more weaponry, we're going to have to hold off for now. And I know I'm not making any divisions, so let's go ahead and train our guys then. Oh, and let's grab a uh, dude here first, too. Uh, it doesn't really matter too much. This is an armor leader, so there you go. Everyone here, go ahead and train for now, and actually you guys, I'm going to convert you to this division, which I don't know if it's good or bad, but I'm going to convert you anyways. And we need some more army XP. Siano meets with King Umberto II. Today, His Excellency, the Duce and the Prime Minister of Italy, Galeazio Siano, has met with His Royal Highness of King Umberto II in the latter Roman's residence at Palazzo del Quirinal. The talks between the two have been largely kept secret from the media, but many speculate that Siano is trying to seek the King's support in his political schemes. What's particularly attractive for the media is the upcoming Verona Congress, scheduled to take place a few months take place a few months from now. The two are natural political allies, as many of the hardline fascists opposed to Siano's reforms also call for the abolition of the monarchy. The first national Congress of the PNF during Siano's reign is Duce. The Congress will take place in the Venetian cities, famed as a setting of Romeo and Juliet, like in the Shakespearean tragedy. Verona will be the battlefield of two angry opposing factions, with Carlo scores of growing ever more powerful and respecting it. Italy's political apparatus and the loyalty of the army and the black shirts uncertain. It can only be hoped that the senseless tragedy portended by the play will not come to pass. King Umberto is, though, well known for his shyness regarding politics, so it's hard to predict what actions he'll take, if any at all. However, with a political storm likely approaching on the horizon, many look towards the crown as a stabilizing factor, one which the nation hopefully won't need. At a time when many had written off the whims and wants of monarchs as relics of a long forgotten age, it seems that loyalty still has a little kick left in it. Long live the king! Forty years of fascismus. In forty years, Italy has gone far from a nation threatened by poverty and Bolshevism to a glorious victory in a world war from a weak country almost destroyed by the First World War to one of the globe's major powers. For better or for worse, fascism transformed our nation, turning it into it is what it is now. The names of Mussolini and other great men of the regime will forever be consigned to history books as the creators and leaders of this brave new era. However, though, fascism's legacy is complicated, and while some feel that the conquests of the fascist revolution have not gone far enough in creating a new order, many more believe that the fascist era has entered its final years. None can tell this is for the 40th anniversary of the March on Rome marks the beginning of the end, or merely the end of the beginning. Oh boy. Oh my giddy aunt. Now we need way more support equipment and infantry equipment and artillery and anti-tank. Oh goodness me. Oh dearie. Ah, 40 years later, 40 years later, that's how long it takes to build an empire. 40 years, that's how long it takes for a nation to turn from a second-tier country into a global power spanning over three continents and including several nations under her protective watch. The Italian eagle has spread her wings over the Mediterranean and has risen over her enemies and defeating the British line, reclaiming its Roman heritage. Troops paraded in Rome to celebrate the start of the ascent to imperial glory, the march on Rome taking place in 1922, exactly 40 years ago. 
men of the MVSN paraded among the Fori Imperali, painting the Roman streets black with their uniforms, tanks of the uh, Regio Esercito rode into the streets, demonstrations of the might of the new legions, the Regia Marina paraded with Junio Valerio Borghese and the XMAS as its head. As a crowd cheered the hero of Gibraltar and Alexandria, finally the aerobatic team of the Regia Aeronautica, the Frisa Tricolori, painted the skies of Rome green, white, and red as the people looked below in awe. And after it was all done one by one, the families who came to see the soldiers paraded all went home, the fanfare ended, the politicians left the stage, and the troops returned to the barracks. Silence returned in the skies of Rome as the moon illuminated the now empty Fori Imperali and the Colosseum. Or the Colosseum. A display of might is always reassuring, but sometimes it hides the true reality of things with dissent spreading among the population, violent divisions and demonstrations emerging in the PNF, and the colonial empire becoming more and more unstable in trouble. The future of Italy and all of Europe hangs in the balance. In the middle of the night, one man is still awake in the Palazzo Chigi. A pile of documents sits on the Duce's desk, reports from ever more worried about colonial governors, letters from the members of the PNF obliquely criticizing him, and communiques from foreign leaders slathered in empty praises and vague words. However, in the silence of the night, Ciano is reading something else, a novel titled The Leopard, published a few years ago by a Sicilian author, and one quote strikes him particularly. Things change so that they can stay the same. Oh, yes. So, also, let me know in the comments below if I'm mispronouncing words. I would like to make sure I mispronounce words less often, if I can. Prepare for the Malta Congress? Congress? Congress. Eventually, but Imperio. Italy currently boasts the world's fourth largest economy, its vast empire and sphere of influence spanned over three continents, a focus on proper foreign policy, which in the past has been neglected in favor of the pursuit of autarky, is now necessary to mend the various issues that plague the empire and its subjects. Deals with foreign powers, rework relationships with vassal states, and increase integration into the empire are just some of the problems that have to be addressed to achieve the prosperity we do deserve. And let's take a look down here. So, things are not really improving too much. Point seven five zero zero. Minus 0.25, which is not very good, but the poverty rate is still not too bad. Industrial expertise is going up a little bit. Not bad dealing with the empire. The, the, being at the helm of an empire is sometimes not as great as it's made out to be. Something the Italian government soon discovered not long after the end of the high that followed the victory in the Second Valkyrie. With the Italian empire suddenly expanding to include many more territories and protected states, numerous problems quickly arose, mostly due to unending partisan activity, resistance from subject peoples, and a slow recovery from the devastation of the war. Alanthropa only made things work, wrecking the economy of numerous nations and forcing Mediterranean trade to be funneled across the Suez, the lifeline of the empire. In such a situation, even the most staunch of conservatives can see the writing on the wall and be convinced that some form of action is needed, especially to amend the poor trade situation and to strengthen the empire in general. The Duches propose a series of radical changes to the administrative and economic realities of a great empire, and no doubt change shall come. Hopefully it's changed for the best. Oh, an assassin strikes at Hail Hitler? Well, good for him. Japanese cooperation, why now? While the old Axis alliance is no more and a relationship with Germany has gone down the drain since the Second Belt Krieg, we've always been much friendly with the Japanese. As natural trade partners in the Indian Ocean, Italy and Japan have always enjoyed good relationships and good trade, but there's certainly more that we can do to bring our two great countries even closer and snuggle up with one another. Well, maybe we won't snuggle up with one another, but you know, you get the idea. Hey, but maybe we'll send them, they'll send us some anime or something like that. Oh, oh, trade deals with Japan. Oh, we got this too, look at this. Paolo Vaccari. I don't even want to look at the other the person above because it looks like they have the same thing. Demo. Tough. Oh, actually, that's probably better. Let's go with Anno. Oh, let's cut the death down. So, trade deals with the Japanese. To the east, the ocean gleams shining with opportunity. Whilst our relationships with Germany might have gone sour, our friendship with Japan is still as strong as it, as it was when the Tripartite Act, or Pact, was first signed in 1940, despite the recent and troublesome events that shook the two great empires. The most natural solution to a reinvigorate our economy would be a renewed trade compact with Japan, allowing us to exchange oil and manufactured goods for cheap resources extracted in the sphere, which will serve to fuel our industrial expansion. A team of diplomats, including representatives of the ENI, handpicked by Enrico Matai, had started to negotiate the exact terms of these accords with representatives from the Rising Sun, and it seems that an official visit by the Japanese Prime Minister Ino is going to take place in Rome soon. Trusted friends are always, always nice to have. Italo-Japanese partnerships. The economies of Japan and Italy are extremely compatible with one another, as Italians can offer the massive amounts of oil in exchange for Japanese manufactured goods and raw materials from the sphere nations in anime. By signing closer trade deals, we can increase the volume of goods moved between our respective sides of the Indian Ocean, therefore for increasing our profit margins and the amount of money we'll be able to invest in our empire. More trade is always good for us and we will have more than enough oil to spare. Just look at our fuel. Hitler names Goring. Oh crap, this is what happened when I played Italy the first time. It, oh god, Goring has been, oh no, 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 oh boy. Well, then again, 
Goring might not go that far, but Roman evenings. The sun sets over Rome, its rays playing with the branches of the cypress trees that line the Ap Appian Way. The cobblestone road seems to stretch eternally in the hills that surround the city as it once did when Roman legionaries, merchants, peasants, and emperors walked along it. Now the Ap Appia Antica is much more quiet, and only two people are walking on it, talking quietly in perfect French, the language of diplomacy. After all the fanfare, the politics, and crowds, the Duce proposed a tranquil walk among the Ro Roman ruins of the Appian Way to conclude the last day of Japanese Prime Minister Hiroa. Hiroya, Eno's official state visit to the Italian capital, as the sound of cicadas is heard faintly in the background. Siano and Eno find themselves more and more involved in their informal conversation, which started from personal themes such as taste in music and theater, but rapidly took much more melancholic undertones. As the first stars begin to appear in the evening sky, two men realize more and more that perhaps even if separated by oceans and continents, they are not much different from each other. The burdens of ruling an empire on the brink of catastrophe, threatened, out, threatened by outside enemies and torn by internal fights, the extenuating task of being forced to commit ever more morally dubious acts of real politique. The ever-present terror of the possibility that in the end it was all for nothing, such things cannot be easily shared, but perhaps in that Roman sunset. As the cicadas sung, two men found some peace, even if it was just for a passing moment. Sometimes one needs to put things into perspective. But we have unlikely friends. As a result of the renewed Italian-Japanese partnership, Japanese Prime Minister Hiroya Ino has been invited on an official state visit to Rome. Galezio Siano is quite the charmer, and he's already preparing to make sure that this visit goes as smoothly as it could. The most refined, entertaining, most exquisite food, the most sublime music, the most elegant dresses, and a glass of our best wine to accompany it all. Considering that the Duce is famously well-spoken and cultured man, so it wouldn't be surprising if a genuine friendship blossoms between Siano and his Japanese counterparts. Not bad, my friends. Train, 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 my soldiers. And... The Nagasaki Trade Compact, a new commercial agreement was signed today in Nagasaki by Italian diplomats and representatives from Japan, Manchuria, China, Guangdong, and several other nations of the co-prosperity sphere. Perhaps an event not attracting as much attention as the naval exercises or the state visits, that, however, far exceeds them in importance. Both nations that stand and benefit from the new trade compact as it allows freer circulation of goods and capital in the Indian Ocean, thus linking the vital resources possessed by the two empires. Here's a profit. Dalia Chiesa requests more men, though. Governor, Dal uh, Governor Chiesa of the Levant has put an official request for additional Italian troops to reinforce his own garrison, setting rubble activity, trade security, and increasing common Turkish border patrols. The governor claims that Italian support is vital for the continued stability of the empire. Greater involvement in Levant would, of course, provide control and authority in the region, especially in opposition to the Turkish government, which has been increasingly aggressive as the relations have declined. However, committing forces to defend the Levant would leave less flexibility in imperial policy. The safety of the empire has always rest in the Duce's capable hands. Now, when I played as Italy forwards the fascist path, I went pretty much all in, so let's try something else. One can never be too careful. The last thing Chiesa needs is more troops. Hmm. Alright, a common interest. The Regia Marina and the Imperial Japanese Navy are the two most fearsome fleets that now sail the world's wide oceans, and their respective spheres of influence encompass opposite sides of the Indian Ocean. By working together, these mighty navies can ensure peace and order in the Indian Ocean by stamping out piracy and policing the high seas. As a sign of friendship, the Regia Marina and the IJM will conduct joint military exercises and drills. Not only will this strike fear in the heart of our rivals, but will also give us important insight on how the world's foremost naval superpower manages its navy. Which is a good thing to know, you know? Look at that, naval XP. Beautiful. Yum yum. So we're obsessed with Japan as an Italian ship calls in, or sails into the port of Tokyo on his desk deck are hundreds of containers, some carry the goods that are famously Italian, like wine, motor scooters, and the like. In others, machine parts and grain, only a few hundred meters away, barrels of oil are piped out of Italian tankers, Italian oil. Extract from North Africa now fuels the Japanese army from Manchuria to Bengal, offsetting the need to exploit the relatively limited sphere of reserves. But the success does not, does not stop there. No, it goes far further. Italian ties and suits fly off the shelves in Mitsukoshi department stores. Italian cinema dominates Japanese theaters in Italian Italy fever has seemed to have swept Japan. It certainly will not last, but it still proves just how quickly a new friendship has come together. Still, the most important effect of our new success is the cash that returns to Italy to Italian artisans and Italian manufacturers. This new cash will help in the rejuvenation of our economy and will help us propel in us into an Italian century. Salute! Designation of Tokyo, though, with our newfound partnership with Japan, our diplomats there, spearheaded by industrialist and ambassador Ettore Conti, have proposed a creation of an apartment Italian economic delegation in Tokyo. This delegation will be led by a board of Italian business and finance representatives that will act as their beachhead into the Japanese commerce and finance, keeping the ties with representatives of the Japanese government and the various zaibatsus, allowing us to tie our economic economy even closer to that of the prosperity sphere. Tokyo and Rome are on the opposite side of the globe, but they have never been so close. That manpower keeps going down, which is trumbling. Let's go spend more money now. 
Uh, so I actually before I started even recording someone asked me on my discord server How do you deal with the debt and trying to get more liquid reserves? I always just build civilian factories because usually once you get your army good enough It won't even matter how many factories you have and that actually costs you more money the more military factories you have But more civilian factories helps you with debt or at least helps you with getting Lowering debt and maybe getting liquid reserves. So Italian delegation sent to Tokyo in a newly constructed building the Bunkara Ward of Tokyo The Italian economic delegation has finally set up shop the culmination of the new trade deals recently undertook by Italy with Japan The delegation will serve as a board of businessmen and industrials to keep in context and renewing deals with Japanese Zaibatsus and Karatsus Much to the advantage of Japanese or Italian businesses selling and buying in the area representatives from the ENI Olivetti and Mechanica, and even relatively minor ones like Ferrari will now have a direct link with the Far East, allowing the Italian government to reap the benefits of transoceanic trade. Kenpai. Senpai, potential in India. Since the 19th century, a foreign colonial policy has always had an eastern direction, with their two earliest colonies, Somalia and Eritrea, located on the shores of the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea, respectively. Therefore, it's only natural that we see closer trade deals and relationships with India, as this won't only allow us to find new profitable markets to sell our products to, but also reinforce our geopolitical presence in the Indian Ocean. Aw, oh, yeah. That man part just keeps going down and down. Oh, 20 and 1. Nice. Not, that's not bad. Yeah. Indian trade, my friends. At, after Adlan threw up and the collapse of relations with Germany, the Indi Italian Empire was left starved for trade. While the formation of the Triumvirate has ameliorated these issues to an extent, more trade relations with other countries can't hurt our country. To this end, our diplomats have entered talks recently with the Republic of India, a natural trade partner of the Indian Ocean, in an attempt to increase trade between our two nations. It seems that our efforts have borne fruit as the Indian government has agreed to sign a trade agreement between our two great nations, which will surely improve our trade issues. Another step in the long road towards economic recovery. Democracy can work? Despite having recently gained its Independence from the British oppressors, India appears to be a relatively stable and rapidly growing state. Some in Italy say that this happened despite its democratic and popular government. Still, many are starting to think that India's new profound prosperity and stability is actually the result of a well-managed democracy. As goods and people pass through our Indian Ocean ports in ever greater quantities, ideas are starting to pass through as well and have a friendly and a powerful democratic ally which surely do no good for the fascist cause in Italy, which is a great thing to read about because we want to be as democratic as possible. Or as as democratic as we can possibly be, but the Indian system. Italy and India, the two I countries, have never been particularly close in isolation and reinforced by the distance and opposed politics. Still, in some ways, India is not too distant from us. They are a secondary power with few friends and many enemies. Despite this, we both still have stood tall in a hostile world. We're not as powerful as the Reich or Japan, but we're still a force to be reckoned with. However, much to the chagrin of many fascists here in Italy, they are not fascists. The intellectual basis for the continuation of the fascist regime is that a relatively isolated power such as ourselves can only stay alive through a strong order of nation casting away pretension such as individualism and democracy as detrimental to the ultimate goal. In India, it in contrast holds free elections, lack of corporatist economy, and is not culturally constructed around a staunch sense of nationalism, yet somehow they are still powerful. And Nehru's government is quite stable, on par with us and on par with the world. How could this be? Perhaps men are not tired of liberty. Open up Indian Ocean trade, though. Many of the archaic and protectionist restrictions put into place by foreign in foreign trade before World War II are still present and are a hindrance to profit and commerce in the Indian Ocean. By creating new bureaucratic and legal frameworks to allow freer commerce and movement of goods and people in the Indian Ocean, as well as further investing into the infrastructure, we can turn eastern ports such as Mogadishu or Mogadishu, Dubai, and Assab into international maritime trade hubs that will make our vast empire even more profitable. Oh, yes, please. I love profit. 11%, huh? Well, could be better. Indian Ocean Win. Chairman Matai looked out from the windows of the ENI's HQ building in Dubai, a modern, shiny building made of glass and steel, but are still somewhat influenced by the rational st style typical fascist architecture from his office. He could enjoy an eagle's view over Dubai's port, and where he saw a large ship from which many men, not too dissimilar from ants at this distance, slowly disembarked one by one. The first ship of workers from India had arrived. Dubai is a very strange place, envisioned by the fascist leadership as a shining city in the desert, built as a pet project to rival Athanthropa, it rapidly became a fiefdom of ENI when staggering amounts of oil were discovered in the area. Fueled by oil fever, Dubai kept growing and expanding its oil and naval industries are ever thirsty for more manpower. Thanks to the new trade deals between Italy and India, new and marvelous opportunities of profit will be realized in Dubai, much to the benefit of both great nations. Gentlemen, welcome to Dubai. Imperial renewal, how about that? Our empire is currently a patchwork of directly governed territories such as Montenegro and Albania, military governance such as the Levant, puppet states such as Croatia and Egypt, allies, and friendly regimes such as Arabian monarchies, and even a vice royalty of the Italian East Africa. Therefore, it should be no surprise that such a vast empire is somewhat disjoined. However, we should focus on improving economic and political integration between the various territories under our control, building more infrastructure, encouraging political reforms, and investing in the underdeveloped parts of the empire are just some of the things that we can do to move closer to achieving a status truly worth the other name, Pax Romana, or Pax Roma, really. 
The Great Bulgarian game, Bulgaria, since the closing days of the Second World War, has been closely linked to Germany and her pact. This was an issue for Bulgaria and was even profitable for the two for nearly a decade. The Great Market Crash of the 50s changed everything, however. So closely tied to the German economy, it was only natural that the Bulgarian market followed suit. Bulgaria has very nearly left the pact, though the Germans, exerting the rest of their influence they had in the region, managed to threaten, bribe, and call in a favors to pact the Bulgarian administration with pro-German ministers. To keep the government under close watch, the Germans shortly after deployed a garrison to Sofia itself to help keep the peace during the turmoil, supposedly. Ten years later, and one still sees German boots patrolling the capital. Times are perhaps changing, however. The Bulgarian government is perhaps ripe to be overthrown. Prime Minister Gabrovsky, well known to be in German hands, recently died in a car accident. Rumor surrounds his death, but whether he was assassinated or truly did die in a tragic accident means whether means nothing really. His death is given the underground fatherland front the hope they need to begin acting against pro German elements in the country, and as Italian influences attempt to sneak their way into the country, the Reich has begun to crack down on what they see as dissident activity. Only time will tell what will result from the two's meddling in Bulgaria, and so the great game o begins though. So as I don't want to make the same mistake I did with the first flight Italy. So we are on the right side here. So we're two, and we need either political power support equipment, or guns. And we have none of that because I wanted to make sure our divisions were a little bit stronger than what we had. So right now, what we're going to do is really, really make a crap ton of guns. Like, too many guns. Like, so many guns. Oh, wait, that's not guns. This is guns. These are guns. There we go. Make as much guns as possible. Maybe even support equipment, but just guns. We want as much guns as humanly possible in the arms of our soldiers. That's, that's as many guns as I can make right now. We might be able to make seven a day, which really sucks. So, we're probably not going to get Bulgaria. Um, maybe I should not convert our divisions to need more stuff, but Imperial Renewal Policy. A new round of meetings is set to take place in the Italian capitals. Representatives from the local governments of several Italian puppet states and Imperial dependencies have gathered to push for new policy to be implemented across the Empire. Delegates from Egypt, led by Commissario Italo Balbo, together with generals from the government of the Levant, a, crowd, a small crowd of politicians, and even native representatives from the Italian East Africa, all convened in Rome, each hoping to see reforms and changes brought about for the slice of the Empire. The path to further cooperation and integration among the various parts of the Empire won't be an easy one, as contrasting interests and the quest for more autonomy make this endeavor a political nightmare. However, important concessions have already been made by Roma Siano renewed promises to increase political autonomy for its states under Italian protection to loosen the hold that the Italian armed forces to have over the territories of the Levant. Perhaps the Imperial Dream isn't dead yet? You know, I'm going to go and do this. I don't ever do this, but we will gain more manpower in the such. So we can see what we can do about that at the Algerian summit. The situation in Algeria is, to put it simply, a complete, absolute mess. Pianuad militias, native insurgent groups, and settler defense groups all fight over the territory and oil-producing regions. At the same time, the whole country is not only still part of the French state. In recent years, though, Algeria became the theater of low-intensity warfare between these different groups and the city events of Iberian soldiers and settlers into the territory is rapidly becoming a source of concern among both the Italian settlers and our military. We must immediately call some of Iberia to resolve the situation before it escalates any further. Ah, uh, here we go. Political power, we have two. Well, I guess we're going to try this one first. Establish communications and relics of a bygone era. It was a clear morning in Juneau when the crowd gathered in front of the dockyards on a stage before them. Podesta Vittorio Pertusio stood surveying his audience. Those assembled before him were dressed in a mournful black and gray, the clothes of a funeral fitting, for it was a funeral that Pertusio would conduct. Behind him stood a rusting dry duck, the last part of Juneau's pride that the city hadn't scuttled yet, and behind that stretched endless windswept salt flats, the gifts of Alanthropos. Seeing that the square was filled to capacity, Pertusio Pertusio, yeah, began his eulogy of the Genoese port. From the beginning, Genoa was a city of sea. Its port had transformed it from a small town on the coast to a thriving hub of commerce. For centuries, Dionysia, Dionysia, uh, sailors had ruled the Mediterranean, trading from Constantinople to Malacca, and it was only the rise of the Atlantic trade that reduced its prominence. However, this would not be the end of Genoa's maritime activities, for following the unification of Italy, Genoa would once again become a major port. From its dry docks, or dockyards, were built some of the most beautiful ships to ever sail the seven seas, titans such as the SS Achilia and MS Augustus. But then, the Atlantic returned with a vengeance to put down Genoa's seafaring, this time forever. As Pertusio finished up his narration, he looked up and noticed the eyes of tens of thousands upon him. As they watched, he stepped forward to place his hand upon the detonator and with a heavy heart pressed the button upon it. An enormous crack ringed the air as the last dry dock of the Genoa exploded, the shockwave being felt even from his distance. After the last piece of debris settled, silence reigned. Then the crowd slowly wandered back home, having witnessed the end of an era. Later that day, following a preliminary meeting by city officials on how to move forward, Pertusio languished in his office, having ingested more than enough servings of pedo... Piedmontese wine. As the minutes passed, his anger and conviction grew further and further until they reached the breaking point. In a drunken rage, he tore off his PNF pin and threw it in the fireplace, watching the cursed symbol turn to ashes. He now knew what he must do the next morning. He sent his letter of resignation to the local PNF headquarters. The Italians loved to blame the Germans for their misfortunes, but it was Mussolini's repulsive ideology that had gotten him into this mess in the first place. 
Bertuzzi had never been a friend of fascism, but he could no longer pretend to care about it to serve Italy. But if he was going to ever serve in office, it would have to be under a government truly of the people, like the Democrats of decades past. And thus, fascism claimed another victim. Very good. Alright, so that's just going to give us more than enough guns for now. Uh, I usually don't like doing stuff like that, but it doesn't really matter. So, the Algerian summit diplomats from Iberia and Italy have met in Palermo to discuss the current situation in Algeria. Considering the extremely chaotic and complex situation that the region currently is in, the news that the summit ended without any serious accomplishment was taken with no surprise. The poorly defined and porous borders between the military administrations of the two respective countries have done little, very little, to halt the passage of weapons, militias, and smuggled goods from one side to the other, and each country was happy to blame the other for that. Other points of contention include the support and armament of Pierre Noir's militias, mostly reunited under the Cité Catholique uh, umbrella organization held by Yvonne Yves Guerin Serac by Iberia's military government. Iberian representatives responded by pointing out that the rampant mafia activities in, uh, in Italian controlled areas and the alleged support given by Italy to Algerian independence groups. Each side ended up denying the other's accusations, but it seemed that what truly caused this heated climate was leaked reports from the ENI, the Italian oil company, suggesting that the Algerian region may be rich in oil deposits. With all these overlapping interests in the general instability of the area, many predict that an escalation might be inevitable. Is this yet another war on horizon? Let's hope so. But the Balkan Initiative, our hold on the Balkans is currently dependent on three things. First, the several regions under our direct control, such as Montenegro, Albania, and Dalmazia, which in many cases are inhabited by non-Italian populations who have expressed discontent at a rule. Secondly, the Kingdom of Croatia, an anomaly independent nation and factually puppet state, dealing with partisan insurgencies and ustasi terrorism. Thirdly, Greece, a state barely holding on to itself together under the pressure of several well-armed and trained insurgent groups. The situation isn't exactly looking rosy, so addressing our Balkan woes is in order if we don't want that gosh darn peninsula turning into the spark that ignites yet another conflict. Oh boy, the Balkans. And we I do want to send volunteers to the Levant this time and be able to crush any Turkish forces there, which will be a very good thing. Reeling in Croatia, though, with the situation in Croatia becoming ever more worrisome, Xiano's released a press statement regarding the possibility of a greater involvement in Italian forces in the region. Well, in the past, the Italian government has always presented its puppet state Croatia as a successful and prosperous country. Xiano painted a grim picture of the real situation in the kingdom, citing the recent rise in partisan activity and ever-present threat to the Ustase. Croatia has enjoyed close ties to Italy since World War II, when an Italian king was placed on the throne of the newly created kingdom. However, it seems that soon the country might find itself occupied once again by Italian forces, intervening to shore up the kingdom against insurgent movements. This cannot end well. But rights for refugees. After World War II, Italy and her former German friends have started to drift apart more and more as allies rapidly turn into bitter rivals in the chaos that followed the economic crash of the 50s. A wave of refugees coming from Germany, mainly Jews and members of the of mainly other members of ethnic groups, made their way to Italy to escape Nazi persecution and oppression. Many of them were settled in new Adriatic lands reclaimed by Atlantropa and having lived there since then. While these communities have integrated rather well into Italian society, they still lack numerous fundamental rights granted to Italian citizens. We should move towards giving equality and rights to these men and women so that they can too become children. Of Rome. Very good. I don't think we'll be able to get up here. Yeah, we still need more, probably a lot more support equipment. So let's buy connections to the front, probably. This one is two to four, two to three. And eh, we'll risk it, why not? So we need to get a lot more support equipment right now. So let's go and try to get that since we have enough guns at the moment. Let's do something like this and maybe try to rush for guns. How about that? The situation regarding German refugees. In the last decade, the political relationship between the former Axis powers of Europe, Germany, of course, Italy, soured to the point of no return and turned the two allies into bitter rivals. When the economic crisis rocked the German sphere, it, Italy also suffered, but certainly not as much as its northern neighbor. Thus, Italy became a natural destination for the thousands of refugees that sought escape from Nazi persecution and terror. Seizing their chance to flee the grasp of Germania and the chaos of the West Russian War and the economic crash, numerous Jews, Roma, Sinti, and even other persecuted groups such as homosexuals fled towards Italy, hoping to find refuge in a country that, while still fascist, was much more lenient than the right towards discriminated groups. The then Minister of Foreign Affairs and Alduce Galezio Siano was supportive of Mussolini's decision to give refuge to escaping masses, and many of them were dispersed across the vast reaches of the empire. However, many still live in refugee camps and temporary structures. Many of them are located in the reclaimed lands in the Adriatic. Alduce signed an order allocating resources to encourage integration and eventual path to citizenship for the German refugees in order to turn them from a burden on the back of the state into a valuable asset for empire. The Roman Empire was all about assimilation and integration, after all. So so where do we send them? Do we send them to like Ethiopia? 
maybe, the end of military dominance of Libya. The territories of Libya were annexed to the Metropolitan Kingdom of Italy in 1934, under the leadership of Governor Italo Balbo since then. The indigenous Arabs who inhabited Libya have been granted the status of Italian Libyan citizens, which gives them a legal status, identical to the Italians, however. This legal status is only valid as long as they reside in Libya. Outside of it, they're simply colonial subjects of the crown. The Muslim population of Libya has proven their loyalty to us time and time again. We believe it's time to remove these restrictions and grant the Libyan Arabs the full state or status of Italian citizens. We don't get that much political power now, do we? Big sadness, which is something we're going to have to deal with for a while. And I might just give myself political power depending on how bad it is. The integration of Libya, though. In a historic turn of events, all barriers left between Italians and Libyans were torn down by Siano's signature as the new laws finally proved granting Libyans with Italian citizenship. Siano announced that this decision is by condemning mistakes committed by Italy in the past regarding Ital Libyan population, re referencing the infamous massacres committed on Cyrenaica in the 20s, while at the same time expressing his hope that this reform is the last act of the decades long integration of Libya within Italy. With the Italian and Arab populations having lived largely in peace for about two decades now, this new law recognizes the de facto assimilation of the native Muslim population and the Italian administrative unity. Public opinion has been mixed about this new development, but the Libyan public opinion generally proved the elimination of one last bureaucratic hurdle that kept them from being considered full Italian citizens, but many wonder if this is truly enough to contain autonomous and independence groups from being active in the region or if this decision might backfire in the future. At least, hopefully, it should. Crush you, Stase, though. After Yugoslavia was invaded by Axis forces in WW2, the independent state of Croatia was established as a kingdom in the Italian sphere of influence with Iomi de Sajova Aista ruling as King Tomislav II. However, the real power in the country was in the hands of the Ustase, a fascist and ultra nationalist party and paramilitary known for its brutality against Serbs and other ethno religious minorities. The leader Ustase, Ante Pavelic died in 1959, which allowed us to intervene more directly in Croatia and sidelining the Stasi more and more to the point that they have turned against us and are now waging a guerrilla war against the kingdom. We must quickly move more resources to the men to Croatia to crush the Ustasi and its fanatical followers before they grow too powerful. Hopefully we don't get involved too much over there. And what do we have our forces? Because I would like to make sure that uh, we can just bum rush in and just take them out as fast as possible. So that is really my hope. For this, so and we also have a lot of planes here too. So well, maybe not a lot, but we have some. Very good. He has a request emergency powers. The Italian Middle East has always been described as a powder keg of the ethnic and religious divides, an increasingly precarious house of cards balancing between three major religions and several heavily armed militias. In response to the increasing tensions in the region, Governor General Chiesa, Chiesa has sent the Italian government a request for sweeping emergency powers to keep the peace. This would include the power to commit, conduct summary trials and rule by decree. Under a more ambitious general, this might be cause for alarm. However, Dalla Chiesa is generally known for a conciliatory man loath to resort to such drastic strong arm tactics. If someone like him asks for emergency powers, we can safely assume that the situation in the region is dire enough to warrant them. Well, no precaution. We should avoid making tyrants of ourselves. Yeah, that's probably a good thing to do. Probably, but maybe not. You never know. And research, looking not too bad. We got four research slots. But Operation Trollista. The international press is reporting that the troops of the Croatian Kingdom, aided by Italian advisors and reinforcements, have begun to carry out Operation Trollista, a countrywide military and a police operation aimed at arresting prominent people associated with or part of Ustase and eliminating their holdouts in rural areas of the country and urban areas. The operation sometimes resulted in guerrilla warfare as Ustase supporters were informed about the operation in advance and fought back against the soldiers who came to apprehend them. In rural areas, the situation was much worse. Heavy fighting had been reported in mountainous regions in which Ustase paramilitary groups took control of a few hamlets and villages, many of which were either besieged or conquered after brutal combat or simply bombed into dust by tail and artillery fire. Overall, it is difficult to gauge exactly how much troll this has actually weakened the Ustase. While many members of the paramilitary organization have been either arrested or killed, numerous important figures of the organization, including its de facto leader, Jules Frenetic, seem to have vanished into thin air, escaping the grasp of Italian and Croatian forces. Hopefully this is enough to stop those fanatics and in a Croatia center stage. Croatia is quickly revealing itself to be the weak spot in her empire, with the Ustase becoming an ever greater threat in the Zavin... Zavno partisans getting stronger with every passing day. The situation might quickly slip out of control if we don't immediately intervene. The autonomy and independence granted to the Croatian government will be further reduced, declaring a state of a national emergency, giving supreme power to the cadre of Italian generals and advisors surrounding King Tomislav. An empire is not too different from a chain, and Croatia is its weakest link. It, we cannot allow it to break. And we're at eight. Oh, so oh, so we need two. Oh, that's pretty bad. There's a 33% chance we will do okay. The Germans look like they're done as well. How much support equipment do we currently have? We have 40. We need way more than 40. Holy smokes. Operation Tayuta. At midnight of yesterday, Italian troops deployed along the border with Croatia have launched Operation Tayuta. Our Italian armored columns and troops have marched into Croatia, advancing into the kingdom's territory to bolster their already existing garrisons and major several cities. 
several major cities, as well as set up new bases deep in the countryside and the mountains of the country. According to the first reports, anti-partisan operations have already started with sparks fighting in the hills of the interior. The major target of the operation, however, still seems to be the final eradication of Ustase from the country. International media has called the operation a second invasion of Croatia, and any pretense that the country has any sort of autonomy or sovereignty is now lost. Everyone can plainly see that Croatian kingdom is also a de facto an Italian military administration currently struggling to contain its numerous opponents. Italian public opinion has been critical of this new development, as many fall fail to see the benefit of yet another campaign of repression that will surely result in numerous Italian lives being wasted. It might be the only solution, though, to this giant mess in which we must prepare for the Malta Conference. The Mediterranean is our sea, Mayor Nordstrom, at least that's what fascist propaganda tells people. As always, the reality is a bit more complicated than that. Our relationship with other major nations in the area has been regulated by the accords and treaties set up together with the so-called Triumvirate, an alliance reunited the three major nations of the region, Italy, Iberia, and Turkey. However, Increasing issues over different spheres of influence in Algeria, the Middle East, and other such problems are threatening the alliance's stability. A conference in Malta, the center of the Mediterranean Sea, will undoubtedly reinforce the bonds between us and our loyal allies. Absolutely loyal to the T. So how many do we have now? Well, we have 42 equipment. There are 8. So we tie. I'm kind of okay with that. We must prepare for the conference. And send out invitations. La Viata. La Valletta, reclaimed in World War II from the British who were squatting there since Napoleon's times and finally reunited with Italy, has never looked as beautiful as it does now. The flags of Iberia, Turkey, Italy, and the smaller nations of the Triumvirate were waving in the wind, and the hot Mediterranean sun kisses the rooftops and bell towers of the city as ships come and go from its harbor. The only thing left to do now is to send out the formal invitations to the politicians, diplomats, and dignitaries that will arrive from all over the Mediterranean to convene in Malta, where, hopefully, a future peace and shared prosperity for all of our nations can be built. So it looks like we might actually tie here, which is not a bad thing. Gun-wise, 2,500 is still not bad to have. Ah, invitations. Cut that down. Very good. Assassination attempt on King Edward VIII. The Malta Conference, my friend. The triumvirate teeters on the edge of collapse, and every power knows it. Border disputes have existed for decades and have been elevated to skirmishes as the land borders have been created with the creation of Alantropa. Trade is in shambles, the economy is spiraling down, and nobody wants to get along with each other. Hey, just like politics in any era. In one final attempt to save the triumvirate, Cristiano has decided on calling a meeting. If he does not want to do the impossible and pull the alliance from the ashes, then perhaps he will at least end it peacefully. Of course, the location of the conference is on the scale. This one is of paramount importance. The Duce, Cristiano, has a private meeting with his advisor, ad adversary, and party secretary, Scorza. This would have to be of mutual agreement. He would not have his own party spoiling the festivities by making it stink back home or whatever unlucky place was chosen for the conference. The question remained, though, where would it be held? Rome wouldn't do, as the other two powers had already attacked Italy for seeing it as a center of the alliance. Nor would Madrid or Ankara. Siena would not give Franco Salazar or the Turkes the liberty of having gone home on home ground, nor would he allow themselves to be at the center of the triumvirate. As he sat down on the couch drinking a glass of wine, he absentmindedly checked the label with even thought. Maltese wine, his favorite... Wait, Malta! It was perfect. On home trip, but not obnoxiously so. Rich, stable, most importantly, no border disputes. There was a Mediterranean out of every window, glistening through everything that had survived. Delicious food, an ethnically diverse population that managed to coexist. The perfect example. Scorza wouldn't like it, of course, but that was a moot point. Scorza wanted to show off the pride of fascism, which was wrong. It's, um, I'm a pragmatist, he thought to himself, proudly. He, uh, the illustrious Arbogia de Castile in Malta had been chosen and prepared as a site for the upcoming Fort of Conference. It was Siano's favorite place to rest whenever he departed to Malta. Surely his counterparts in Iberia and Turkey would be swept up in the extravagance of the hotel. Send them and let us begin. Oh, what's going on here? Uh, make contact with the fatherland front. Oh, yeah, right there. So you have that one. Testing in progress. Constructing civilian factories. Okay, not too much there. That's totally okay. And we should get the event soon for the Malta Conference, which will be a good thing. As we train, train, train away, drinking up all that extra fuel. And us trying to get as much support equipment as possible. Which is right here, 62. Not great. So it looks like we will end up tying, but you see how it gives an opening speech. Over the past few days, the delegates from around the triumvirate have arrived, tensions are high, and many attendees aren't exactly what sure the purpose of the conference is. Those questions, however, are set to be answered by Duce Galezio Siano takes the stage. Honored delegates, he begins. We've gathered here today to put aside our differences and reaffirm the greatness of our alliance. I know many of you have disputes and issues to raise, but this is the place to do it. Many of the audience are shocked by the bluntness of his words, but there are a few smiles. At least he recognizes this is going to be a complete crap show of members of one Turkish diplomat to another. The triumvirate was forged in fire, Siano continues, and as the world fails, falls back into chaos, we must be open and frank with one another if our alliance is to survive. We are like brothers, squabbling sometimes, but always united in purpose and bound by familial love and com common history, Siano finished. I now invite my brother from Turkey to take the stage. Welcome all. I hope he doesn't screw it up. I just want to slash the budget, man. And anyway, I'm slashing the budget by raising construction spending. 
Oh boy. Hey, 1.33, not bad. And this stuff will we'll probably do stuff here too. So, Turkish speech. As Yano steps down from the stage of the Turkish Bastberg, Alpars, Alparslan, Turkis walks forward, and while the Turkish delegation responds, responds with raucous applause, the rest of the delegation is rather muted. I will not bore you with bland pleasantries like the Dutre. Turkis is halting Italian, is overcome by the directness of his words. Siano is right to one regard when he brings up our shared history. We have a history of disputed borders, he rolls. The Turkish delegation responds with shouts and cheers, while the rest of the conference looks on sullenly. Many expected such a response, but few were prepared for the directness of the Basberg's words. I am not opposed to the triumvirate in and of itself, Turkish continues. The collective security offers is a blessing in this tumultuous world, but if Turkey is to continue to remain a member, we must have our ancestral lands back. We're fed up with the European domination of our sphere of influence. I look forward to meeting with the leaders of our alliance to discuss our disputed claims and the return to the rightful motherland, Turkey. The Turkish delegation practically left from the seats, slamming their feet on the ground and cheering. Quite worrisome. <clears throat> and up. Uh, oh! Also, with uh, this line action, I went with the left side last time. This time, we're going to go on the right side and focus a little bit more on tanks. Which, honestly, with this two plus two organization versus this for the army, this is not worth it. This is absolutely not worth it. So, it's much better to go on the left side, at least for these first levels. So, supply consumption is not bad. This is even better for leg infantry. So, honestly, I wanted a little bit of a change, so that's the only reason why I'm doing it. The left side is just better, in my opinion. But that's just me. I'm going to emphasize the tanks, but funny Cohen Salazar's speech. After the dangerously inflammatory speech, it was time for the two Cadillos of Abirde to take the stage. The two walked together, rubbing shoulders in their attempts to follow a formal protocol. Salazar spoke first. Honored leaders, he began, we wish to see the triumvirate remain united just like a friend and ally at Basbeg's Turkis. And just like him, we have disputes of our own to solve to solve. Of our own to solve to solve. Huh. Frank will pick it from here. However, unlike him, we will not resort to threats of nationalist agitation. We seek a truly equal agreement for all parties of the triumvirate. This was met by jeers and heckling from some of the audience. We are all equal partners in this great alliance. Remember, for whatever reason you are here, there is one issue more important than all the rest. The preservation of our Mediterranean Brotherhood, one and united. The two awkwardly took turns speaking for about half an hour, and while they were met with a polite applause from the audience, a few fairer had dozed off by the time they finished. What's this going to end? But the Levantine chaos, the Holy Land was hardly tranquil in the best of times, and it's quite clear that these are not the best of times. Violence between Jewish paramilitaries in an era of nationalists has, has intensified in recent months, while the number of violent incidents has risen. The garrison struggles to keep the peace as the local population clashes, clashes with both each other and the Italian army. The administration is under increasing pressure to contain the situation, with demands and requests coming directly from the colonial office. Immediate action must be taken to rectify the situation and restore order to the Levant before things get out of hand. I think they can handle themselves. Yeah, let's not get involved in their, you know, politics. Oh, and here we go. So two and one, we're on the right. Lobby for amnesty? Well, we might as well try it, right? So what do we need? We need political power, which we don't have. We need support government, which we don't have. And we need army XP, which we are desperately trying to get, but we don't have. So how about we do this? Let's try to get that political power. Let's try to get the support equipment as well. And maybe some more army XP, but support equipment and political power. How about that? Boost, so we get more political power. Cut that, and then cut that too. Not bad, the opening of the Canal Conference. A major point of contention among the delegates is the Suez Canal. Transferred to Italian control following their victory in Egypt, they have held sole authority over the transit over the canal since then, forcing other triumvirate members to pay dues just like any other country outside the alliance. Iberia especially has long wanted access to the canal as they lack the ground presence of Turkey in the region. Italian and Iberian delegates, with observers from other countries and other triumvirate members, really nations, have gathered in an opulent ballroom to discuss access to the canal. Let us begin. One, two, not bad. It will get better as time goes on. And we're getting more political power, which is great. And... Ital uh, Baron demands. Uh, the, in the first negotiation se negotiating session, uh, Iberian diplomat Ferdinand Maria Castilla e Meaz demanded Iberia have equal access to the canal. Deliberations continued for hours until finally the Spanish slammed his hands on the table. You've held the canal for too gosh darn long, he yelled. Why would should we, your ally, be forced to pay to use it? We'll even give you a one-time lump sum of aid money if you'll let us uh, give us unlimited access. That's my final offer. You can take it or leave it. Ridiculous offer. Refuse. I think we went, came to an agreement last time. We're going to refuse because the thing is destined to fail anyways. So whatever. So five and five, not bad. So now we have that slight big of political power. That's not bad. Let's see what we can do about this. If we can get up to nine, that's not bad either. So, all right. So the next one we can do is either stockpile of support equipment or army XP. We don't have the army XP, and we're really trying to get that stockpile. So we'll try to get the stockpile down here. Siana refuses. Siana fire back. Ridiculous. We've trusted you for twenty years, and this is how you repay us, offering a paltry sum of something we've fought and bled over. Of course not. Negotiations are over. 
Actually, did I already do this one last time? I can't remember. A beer and delicate shock reply. This is outrageous. We expect to be treated as equals, not children. I think I went through this route last time. Whoops. They continued by claiming that they would not participate on later discussions over territorial disputes and concluded with a scathing attack on Siano. We joined you decades ago because you promised equality and freedom from tyranny, but now you know better than the Germans. Lording over us like some petty Rex Commissariat. We're done with this conference, as expected. You know what? I want to go back and see if I can change that up. Alright, so here's the other one where I said, maybe we can negotiate. Siano replies, gentlemen, let's be civil here. I'm not sure I'm not sure if I'm willing to take that trade, but perhaps we can come to another agreement. The Liberian delegation nods warily. Siano and other Italian di diplomats quickly leave the room, quietly whispering while the Liberians deliberate among themselves. Let's see how this goes. And right now, actually, they have seven and we have five for the great game. It is what it is. Hopefully, we can get a lot more support equipment much quicker. Uh, where is support equipment? Oh, oh god, 106. Jesus. Come on, man. Why has it got to be like this? Test your work. That'd be good. Uh, bearing counter offer. They rejoin a few hours later. What about Algeria? Castilla a Maya's approaches. We'll take it in that little insurrection off your hands. We just forget this whole dispute. Your colonial forces are overextended, and you know what? This might be a bit too much, though. Civil Rights Act in the 62, a turning point in the history of their nation. Very cool, very cool. And we are now at 7-7. Seven, seven. Okay, not bad. But now we need uh, Army XP. A sunrise, Suez Sunrise. Another day, another shift for the many soldiers and sailors stationed in the many military installations in the Suez. Egyptian sun is as ruthless as it always was, but in recent times something has changed indeed. More and more ships pass through the canal with each passing day. Japan, India, China, Australia, Thailand, Suez is turning more and more into a true babble of languages and races, all passing through the under, under the watchful eye of the Regia Marina. Since the creation of Atlantis Europa, Suez became the jugular vein of the Italian Empire, one, the one passage that connects the Mediterranean with the rest of the world's waters, Italy's monopoly over its vast, vital asset for the Empire, and there should be no surprise when that, that the place is one of the most heavily, heavily fortified regions in the world, dotted with military ins installations, bunkers, and outposts, and fortifications. Losing Suez is synonymous with losing the empire, and everyone is of, of some importance, and Italy's government knows that perfectly. The fate of a country rests on a canal. Umberto holds a banquet. Our King Umberto II has held a great banquet today. He invited the many nobles still around Italy, however, quite worryingly, many of the top brass of the military invited. While this is apparently just a formal occasion, many people are speculating that Umberto meeting with the military is a sign of greater aspirations. Not like a figure that can do much, though. So, yeah, to get that much, much more, we gotta actually lower, like, all these guys to, like, this level. Do you guys use the uh, support equipment? You guys do. If we do, uh, this, which really hurts us, we will gain 120. You know what? I'm gonna risk it. We will gain enough, and we can throw them back on later on. I don't really care. That's going to really weaken us, and actually, this might actually help, help our budget slightly, but Siano refuses help again. Siano fires back. Ridiculous. We trusted you for 20 years. Actually, this is the same thing we just read. Huh. Not surprising. So, we've already read that, so it is what it is. Let's go and spend this first. Actually, I want to see how long does this last. This lasts 10 days, so we'll see what they do first and see where they're at. And then we'll go do our little thing there. So, it is what it is. Eventually, it's going to fall apart anyway, so no matter what we chose, it was not going to succeed anyway, so. <sighs> it's disappointing, I know. Iberia won't attend board conference. True to the word, the Iberian delegates were nowhere to be seen this morning. It's very dignitary took their seats for the board of conference. Turkish diplomats look relieved while Italian delegates shared worried glances. So, you know, fear the conference is collapsing around us for him. More for us, though. Italian. Oh, hey, we don't have to do anything. Nice. That's good, too. Start of the border conference. By far, by and far, the largest conflict present present in the triumvirate are the many border disputes that sparked up in the triumvirate between all three members. First problem to be resolved, there will be two full days dedicated to negotiating over the nature of these disputed territories. The event started with a noticeable lack of Iberian diplomats as they informed their hosts that they refused to attend it beforehand, as if they're holier than all of us. The Basque bug Al Parcelan Turkis took the podium with an oversized charge of the Eastern Mediterranean following behind him among the rest of the entourage. He began to explain the convoluted ancient importance of Cyprus and Rose to Turkey and the demographics of the islands, particularly what Turkis described as the overwhelming majority of ethnic pure Turks. The Italian controlled lands of Rhodes and Cyprus have long been a thorn in Italy's or Turkey's side, due in part to the large minority of Turks, but also more importantly because of their vital strategic importance, serving as an inlet into the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean. Furthermore, since the completion of Atlantoropa, several of these Italian islands have gained prominent land borders of the Turkish mainland. As the Triumvir deteriorates, and with the Italo Turkish relationship becoming one thinly veiled th of threats and backside slaps instead of friends and allies, Turkis has become much more vocal regarding the issue regarding these rightfully Turkish lands being denied union with the Turkish state. Our demands are clear. We only ask for what's been ours for a millennia, were the words of Turkis on the proposed concessions. We will not back down, we will not fall, we will not stop until we have it. A reminder what action Turkey will surely take sure their demands be refused. No? Maybe we can come to an agreement.
actually here because I want to use you guys as fast as possible. Uh, we're going to go for Zagreb quickly, just in case this falls apart over here. So that'll be good. We have some research to do for some industry, which is good. It is only 62, so let's not grab... Actually, we cra can grab this one first, and let's grab this one as well for military construction. And I'm really glad this happened. So actually, I'm going to convert half you guys back up here as well. So that's not bad. Yeah, we heard her talk about Maybe we shouldn't have done that. But I wanted to be ready and just and secure just in case. So you guys are actually just right down there, which is fine. You guys are holding up there. See how it negotiates. See how it pauses. I think we can make a deal here. Those islands were originally naval bases. They aren't terribly useful as part of the mainland. So I think we can come to some sort of agreement. Turkish nodded as well. Excellent. Let's meet and discuss this. Worth a shot. Definitely worth a shot. Tear in the Holy Land, a hand shaking. A wire turned and folded. A clock wound three times and released. The ticking of the clock danced in the air, in the ear, in the heart. It was everywhere, unseen and untasted, but the permanent, like the still morning dawn. The ticking was rapid, now terrified. It was too fast, too rapid, too terribly erratic, and horribly bent in the wrong vector. The clock couldn't stop. It didn't want to stop. It needed to end the ticking and end the torturous bangs and sharp clicks. Downwards in a spiral pulled up by the heaven's glory. Tick, tick, tick. The explosion rocked the governor's palace. Screams and shots boiled upwards. Dalakiaza, so incredibly fortunate, was frightened nonetheless. Terrors gripped the Levant and only will grow stronger by the day. That's hardly something to worry about. Man, oh man. Pietro Corsini, infantry expert, thank you. Not bad. Not great, but not bad. And you guys just. Uh Falsham Yega divisions, I guess you might call them. Negotiations break down, of course. Negotiations have gone, been going well with the status of some of the islands decided, at least what until Turkish snapped. Would do you insist on treating us like inferiors? He yelled at Siano. Why are you acting like some benevolent god restoring these islands to us? You should be apologizing and paying repa reparations for your illegal colonial occupation. These islands aren't yours to give away. They are Turkish by blood. It had end like that. Well, we're treating... Jesus Christ. Right, come on. Turks, we're literally giving this back. We're giving you this, so... That doesn't point you in a very good corner. Uh, it would be interesting to see what happens when Turkey actually does get a, get a focus tree. Because when they get a focus tree, then all uh, Italy's got to get a, at least a partial rework as well, and probably even Iberia. So it would be kind of interesting to see what happens. But the Malta Conference has been bombed. The first reports that reached Rome were sporadic and disjointed. A fire broken down in the city of Burgu. The Turks have prepared for a trap and invaded Malta. The Greeks Marine were shown in the Fort St. Angelo. Someone tried to shoot El Duce. Attempts to verify anything were unsuccessful as the phone lines to the conference were, site were all down. Some tried to formulate this all into a single narrative, but it was so self-contradictory that it was fruitless. And he, all anyone could do was wait and pray for some good news. Thankfully, it was a way to, of only several minutes before it was confirmed that the Duce was alive and would be returning to Rome post-haste. The clear details also began and trickle in. A bomb went off in Fort St. Angelo, obliterating the conference room, and both the Basbog and Caldelia survived unscathed due to good timing. The identity of the bomber is unknown. If it was done by any of the triumvirate's other member states, it is unlikely that they will take responsibility. Some in Rome have already begun filing or been pointing fingers at Iberia and Turkey, and there are undoubtedly those who will accuse of us as well. Well, tensions were high going into the meeting, now they are absolutely astronomical. Now, the bomber's goal is to sow chaos in the Mediterranean, then he has succeeded beyond his wildest dreams, just when it couldn't get any worse. Hey, this ain't too bad, though. I like this. I'm feeling nice. And we got all that manpower. And by cutting down on military spending, not bad for now. Would you look at all this? Not bad, I'd say. Tur Iberia and Turkey blame Turkey. Well, Iberia and Turkey blame Italy with delegates. Unsurprisingly, out of all the members of the triumvirate, nobody's willing to take responsibility for the bombings. Though Italy claims they had nothing to do with the bombings, it had zero incentive to do so. This has now stopped Iberia and Turkey blaming the Italians for the whole fiasco. Both Iberia and Turkey have withdrawn the delegates from the conference, stating that it is clear they are not safe for them to be there. No, wait, don't leave. Oh no, what could ever happen now? A, f a renewed focus on the budget? Well, if you insist. Alright, so we're still here, and now it'll be 11 and 7 becomes what? And hopefully we win this first one, because we got to get up to 10 max. Hey, we won around, so 3 and 5. So. Administration for political power, which we might not have. Oh, that's a lot of political power, too. For I want to go for big and potentially bold, so let's go with this one with political power. The death of the Triumvirate. From a very secure, undisclosed location in Rome, Duce Sianos announced with a heavy heart on national TV that the natural bond with the Triumvirate, bo mutual bonds of the Triumvirate's member states, are to be dissolved effective immediately. While he emphasized how much it was his idea and his success at deterring German warmongery, it was painfully clear that the alliance would not have been long for this world even without the bombing. It was the inevitable outcome for a union of nations with proud leaders. Opposing goals and competing spheres of influence. No doubt that the news is being met with 
acrimonious agreement in Madrid and Ankara, a mix of happiness that they're finally free and annoyance that they're finally denied the opportunity to dramatically quit first. But the threat of Germany still looms large in the minds of many, and there may be an hour of need where the chamber will sorely be missed. But that hour is so far away, and few will mourn the chamber's passing tonight, and so it goes. It was only a matter of time. You'll break in my heart once again. You always have to go break my heart, don't you? It is what it is. But not bad. At least the world's still looking okay. Russia is in anarchy mode with people killing each other. But hey, what else is new, you know? And we're actually doing relatively okay trying to get Bulgaria on our side. And how about a focus? Ah, yeah, it's the status of the economy. I kind of want to really do that one. Oh, uh, I said this last time. I think last time we went with Kaniva? Fortify the canal, maybe with Dala. Uh, which one? I can't remember last time. Uh, was it Campioni that we needed to do now? Or Defense Plan Cadorna? Do we do Cadorna maybe? Was it Rebuild the Alpine Land? I'll let you guys decide. Now, I'm pretty sure we went with Defense Plan Caniva last time. So, let me know which one of these generals should we do with Defense Plan Campioni? Or Defense Plan Cadorna? Because I honestly can't remember the last time I did this, so you guys will remember better than me. So, let me know which way we should go down. Hopefully, not the same way we went last time, which I think I'm pretty sure it was Defense Plan Caniva. Um. But it is what it is. But let's go ahead and do realities of our situation. A very worrying thought has dawned upon our general staff with the fall of the Triumvir. Our security as a nation has been greatly weakened, and we're in a disadvantageous position if we were invaded by our old enemies, the Germans, or our new ones in our former allies of Iberia and Turkey. Due to this, our generals have drawn up various plans to secure our position, but advise us that only one can be successfully implemented in the time frame the government desires. We must choose, and quickly, we must act. Okay, we got that done down. So let me know. So the status of our economy. The town economy has since Alanthropa never been incredibly stable. The receding waters ruin our former port cities and only trade with our triumvirate allies allow the Italian economy to remain afloat. However, with the collapse of the triumvirate, we are left in a very precarious situation. Thankfully, not all is lost, with the Mediterranean waters finally having been uh, receding. The new port cities will not become obsolete in a matter of years. Furthermore, with, with Italy's expanding industry and control over major trade routes, such as Suez Canal, we can build up our economy so that the loss of Iberia and Turkey as trading partners will not be as the economic death blow that our enemies wish it to be. Which is a very good thing, and maybe we'll read one more uh, focus before we end and conclude today's episode. We could do this stuff, but I'm not really focused on this, as I really, really want to get to other stuff here. Six is not bad. We want something that has four, and this has up to four so that's worth trying with the guns we've got in stockpile. Mass production methods are not bad. 6,500 guns are not a bad thing to have at all. Unless we have to go to war, and then which we're probably not going to do very well, but that's okay. Let's get some more output, shall we? Mass production methods too. Sounds good to me. 40 billion, huh? 40 billion. Well, after that, the tertiary sector, growth rates will increase... National debt will increase. Well, the tertiary sector. Well, the first and second sectors are slowly recovering from our present circumstances. The third has of yet been unaddressed. This cannot continue. We will allocate funds to the construction of new railroads, banks, shops, and furthermore. And more. Furthermore, we will extend support to already struggling businesses uh, and temporarily lower a few restrictions until the economies are fully recovered, of course. With some intervention, Italy's tertiary sector may become a pillar of economy. Oh. Boy. An exercise of futility. The past months have seen a continuous effort to stabilize Italian Levant, yet as we... Yet, try as we will, whether we have used bribes, bulls, or both, it appears that the task of achieving a stable colony in the Holy Land is beyond our capacity. Since the bombing of the residence, Governor Chiesa's communications have been desperately forlorn. The man claims re claims to remain dedicated to his mission, but our assets and his office claim a backup plan exists to safeguard his life in the case of the governor's collapse. They also speak of the streets of Jerusalem, burgeoning as ever with life, but also with couriers carrying intrigues and plots all over the ancient city. The GTA must decide, should Italy act in the face of futility? Let the cards fall as they uh, may, but with this intervention here, I wonder if we can send some dudes and not get involved in... Oh, crap, that sucks. Um, get, get ourselves involved in Levant. We're not at war with anybody, so we should be able to do this. Nine... Oh, we don't do anything we're going to lose. Oh, that is not worth doing. That is really not worth doing. We want to tie. Do we save the political power for later? Screw it, we're going to do it anyways. And let's get this focus as well. The tertiary sector. And hopefully we can intervene in this war, but I guess time will tell. Regardless. Oh, we need to do stuff here too. Send in the black shirts. Oh my goodness. Well, that kind of sucks. But the Kenyan rebellion quote, let's read this and we'll call it an episode. Excellent news has arrived from our African colony in Kenya today. According to a report from the Italian garrison station in the region, the long-standing Mau Mau revolt organized by Kenya Land and Freedom Army has finally ended. With the conclusion of a bitter year-end campaign to root out the native fighters, a fierce final battle erupted over a strategic railway in northern Kenya, which resulted in the complete destruction of local railway stations. Following the skirmish, Italian forces managed to locate and destroy the rebellion's last remaining base of operations. Notable ringleaders of the group, such as senior military official Dedan Kimithai, 
Kimothy were captured and subsequently executed in the raid. With the end of the organized leadership in the KFLA, it appears that the rebellion shall no longer pose a significant threat to the cohesion of the region. Another victory for Italian. I hope you enjoyed today's first episode as Democratic Italy. If you did enjoy it, leave a like. Subscribe if you are new. Check out my Discord link in the description below if you haven't already. And I'll catch you tomorrow as we shall explore Democratic Italy. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.